Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon. I want to thank you for joining me again today. We're uh, in our conclusion of the session on trolling. Uh, we showed contour trolling, we showed pattern trolling, we showed fishing deep break lines on a troll. And we talked about the importance of trolling and then I mentioned to you the last time we talked the 10 points that Buck says are the reasons that you and I need to consider trolling in our fishing if we want to consistently catch the school of fish. So that's what we did and now uh, at the end of that discussion I wanted to tell you about this rod I just received in the mail but I, I picked it up and set it down forgot to tell you about it. <laughs> so I do want to mention it so I don't forget today. Uh, Scott Jenkins at Bucks Bait sent me this rod. He said he wanted to thank me for everything I was doing and I said I'm just trying to uh, tell people the truth about fishing and I said I really am I'm pleased to see your rod and then he informed me that he now personally is making and has been making uh, the trolling rods at Bucks Bait's. And I told him and I meant this and I'll relay it to you. Over the years with Buck, he was always tinkering a little bit, changing rods a little bit, just minute little changes in diameters and different things. And we were always fighting to have the perfect rod. And, and I've got some rods that I made myself that I made probably 35 years ago, still use them. So these solid glass rods, they, they, they don't ever break. You know, you, you can keep them right, keep them good forever. Uh, but uh, when he sent me this rod, I thought to myself when I pulled it out, how pretty it was for starters. And then I gave it to Don Dixon Test, which is to do that flex, which I've shared with you before. And then I measured the rod and I measured all of the diameters. And I want to tell you, this is the finest trolling rod that Buck's Bates ever made. And Buck would be proud of Scott Jenkins. And so I'm thrilled. He sent me a reel, sent me a rod, uh, and I told him, I said, I'm really, really uh, thrilled uh, to get this. And I was going to pass it along because we're just, uh, right now, we're talking about trolling and the importance of trolling. So I'm going to share with you, this rod is perfect in case you have a question about it. All right, now, getting to... Uh, this final discussion. What I wanted to do was try to convince you beyond any shadow of a doubt how important trolling is in your fishing. How important it was in my fishing. The only way I know I could do that is to recall some stories, recall some episodes that I had where only trolling was the way that I could catch a fish. At that time, in that particular fishing situation, trolling was the only way that I could produce fish. And some of those uh, times I've already shared with you. Uh, and in case you haven't seen them, I'm going to go ahead and, and recall some of the ones that might be a repeat that you've already seen. That's okay. I'm trying to make a point today. If you have any question whether or not you ought to include trolling in your fishing, I want this to be the deciding factor. You know, down through the years, and I've shared this with you, as I was promoting all over the country and trying to promote uh, and Buck's material and get people coming to the clinics and the schools, the only way we could do that was to produce fish. So those times when I ha was happy and thrilled and, and could afford to have uh, somebody coming and filming stuff, uh, 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 we did it, but I couldn't afford that back in the day very much. So all we could do was keep a string of fish and shoot some shoot some still pictures, which I did. Uh, but that's what filled the halls. That's what got people coming to the clinics, the fish. Because no matter what anybody ever says, I don't care who it is or what his reason is or what her reason is or, or how they feel or what they prefer and what they don't prefer, what they had for breakfast or lunch, I don't care. In the end... If you and I are in this game, we want to catch fish. If that's the reason we're in this game, I'm going to tell you the way it is. And in order to convince you, in case you're not already convinced, about trolling, I'm going to show you some pictures of some episodes of some fishing situations where trolling was the only way I could produce the fish. 
And if some of it's a repeat, it's a reminder to you, but uh, that's okay because I pick the best ones to my memory, which show more than anything else how important it is to troll first. Let me go back to the first day I met Buck. You all know the story. I've told it twice. I've told it on a blog. I told it on a vlog. Uh, three hours in the boat with Buck Perry in a Florida lake, out in the middle of the lake in 1970 when nobody was fishing out in the middle of the lake. Fishing one-sided bars, which we've studied in our uh, recent talks. We caught 55 of the biggest bass I'd ever seen at that time. They were huge, uh, two or three over 10 pounds, a lot of six and sevens, I mean, just big fish. And we just slaughtered them, there's a picture. Now, we kept two man limit, I'm glad, took a picture. I've had that picture since 1970. Now, every one of those fish was caught trolled. When we studied one-sided bars, I explained to you why in Florida, fishing a one-sided bar trolling is the way to go. Uh, I've had some videos that you've already seen fishing a natural lake in Kissimmee. Uh, examples of that situation. But after I had that first day with Buck, it was a year later. I had been working and working, maybe a year and a half later. I'd been working and working and working, learning to be a good troller. And I finally found a lake that he hadn't fished before in Florida. And I found a bunch of big fish on those one-sided bars. So I invited Buck to come down, which he did. The very following day, he came after I called him. I told him I'd found a really good lake and I was gonna take him fishing for a change. So I took him fishing on one-sided bars. Remember now, we're trolling one-sided bars. It's only breaking a foot, we're trolling. And here's a picture of Buck Perry with the fish he and I caught that day. Oh, oh by the way, I was driving a boat. I was pretty proud of myself. But look at that stringer. Now, of all of the big fish that I've caught in my 45 years, that was the biggest stringer of bass, size-wise, that I'd ever been involved with, that day with Buck Bear. And obviously, he was pretty thrilled, and he was thrilled with my progress as a troll. But if I hadn't been trolling, I wouldn't have caught one of those fish. We wouldn't have caught one of those fish that you're looking at right now. I want you to look closely at those fish. Those are hogfish out in the middle of the lake in deep water on a one-sided bar, caught trolling. Okay, let's move off of that. Uh, I remember telling you the story about the muskie tournament. This is not a joke. Let me show you some pictures. That's my partner. Uh, he only missed a state record by two ounces. And then here's a picture of me. Here we were, two guys in a 14-foot aluminum uh, boat, a uh, V-Hulk with a 9.9 .9 horsepower. I commented one time we had a 25. I was wrong. We hadn't, we hadn't grown to the 25 horsepower till the following year. When we won that musky tournament, we were still cranking out with a 9.9. .9. I had a 10 horse engine and a 14 foot boat. We're up against 248 professional fishermen. They were pros of one nature or another. They were writers. They, 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 they were guides, they were perfect, they, they made their living catching fish and they claimed to be in this little niche of what we would call musky experts, 248 of them. They spent all two days casting the big jerk baits and the big spinner baits and the big plugs in and around the 20 foot weed line. And in two days they caught zero fish. But working with wire out of our little 14-foot boat with a 10-horse engine, my partner Tommy and I caught four muskies, all over 20 pounds, and one of them almost 30 pounds, only two ounces off the state record. And four, 248 other fishermen, professionals, did not collectively catch one fish. That has to tell you something. We were trolling. That was the only way that we could dig those fish out during that weekend. It was a horrendous weather condition. We knew our only chance was to be trolling deep structure, and that's what turned it for us. And you've already heard the story, so I'll move on. How about, <clears throat> I don't know how many times I've mentioned to you already, I've mentioned the saddle up there at the summer schools when I was running Buck Schools. I also told you a story on one of my vlogs about how he sent us up there and said, 
I want you to map 25 miles of water up there and showed us this big huge map and we went to look at it and I found this saddle the very first day right outside the door of the lodge where we were staying and it was so much current no one ever fished there but I knew because of how the the lay of the land looked there probably was a saddle there and sure enough there was and I've shared with you many times we've got over 10,000 big walleye off of that spot over a 17 year period but the very first day I found it Tommy was off in one direction mapping Gun Lake and I was mapping over here on the river and when we met up I told him about this great looking saddle that I found and he said well let's not fish it let's let's go ahead and do what Buck wanted and map all the other areas as much as we can see and I said this place that place the saddles, this saddle and this bar has to produce. It has to be terrific. And I said, I think we could probably have it to ourselves because there's so much current. I don't think anybody else will be fishing. Sure enough, the day before the school started, we decided to check and verify that there were fish there. And we fished it for about three hours. And here's a picture of Tommy with the result. The very first day we fished that saddle. It was the biggest catch a big walleye I've ever been involved in and I've caught a lot of big walleye I've caught a lot of big schools of walleye but this was the biggest it was a huge stringer and we got our pictures and did a lot of promoting off of that stringer but friends every one of those fish were caught between 35 and 47 feet trolling spoon plugs on wire if we couldn't have trolled we couldn't have caught those fish we couldn't have caught the 10,000 fish that were to come afterwards if we weren't trolling. Another thing I'd like to point out, let me point it out right here. Every day we go fishing, we do it in the same exact manner, regardless of lake type, regardless of species involved, etc., etc., etc. And it's so true. I thought when I first started, uh, I was learning how to go bass fishing. Obviously, as you've just seen, it wasn't just bass. And next, I'm just going to show you a little picture of a uh, it was part of our uh, initial TV show that we did where Kirk Gotti challenged me to catch catch some northern pike. So I'm in a lake, I'm fishing a deep bar, and I ran into these fish at 35 feet, and I caught those fish uh, in about 40 minutes. Bang, 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 bang. Big northern. Adult sized fish, 35 feet of water, deep bars are home to fish. But I caught those fish trolling. The bar was big and quite wide. And I didn't catch them all at the same spot, but they were close to the same spot. But trolling was the way to go. It's what produced those fish. Next, how about smallmouth bass? You saw the film a few weeks ago uh, of trolling. Uh, with wire in Lake Erie and we were using a spoon plug and then we were using a trailer bait. And you saw the success of that. Uh, and like Buck once said, could you imagine trying to go fishing out in one of the Great Lakes with just a casting rod? It'd be impossible. You have to be trolling. That's how you're going to catch the fish. And that day, I don't know, we caught 150, 200 fish, something like that. And if we wouldn't have been able to troll, we probably wouldn't have ever caught the first one. Now, let's leave smallmouth bass for a minute. How about catching salmon in, in Lake Ontario? That's what I was doing with a spoon plug, a 200 spoon plug, and one of these trolling rods. I catching 30 pound salmon. So once again, I repeat, we go about our fishing the same way, regardless of lake type, regardless of species of fish, regardless of the time of the year. We'd, we're always going about our fishing in the same manner. We don't have to have 27 different methods of fishing. We do a couple of the same things every day, regardless of species, we're catching those fish. We're running into them. We're using structure as our guide, and we're checking all of our depths and all of our speeds on all the features that are on or connected to that structure. And that structure must, of course, be in relationship to deep water. Deepest water in the lake, the deepest water in the area lake, or the deepest water available in the case of Florida. So here we have all of these examples with all these fish pictures. I didn't make those pictures up. I didn't fish for 10 weeks to try to put eight fish together so I could take a stringer shot. 
And it all started with Buck, 1970, taking me out trolling in the middle of the lake catching all those fish. After I caught those fish with Buck, I really didn't know anything. I, all I know is I was holding the rod. Just like I suggest you get your kids and grandkids holding the rod. We caught all these big fish. I was good enough to reel them in. You know, that wasn't all that hard. But when I went back to Pittsburgh, he had given me a trolling rod and he had given me some lures, gave me some spoon plugs. So I couldn't wait to get out on my home lake to try them. But when I got out on the home lake, I really didn't know what to do. I remember him saying, you know, about a bar, sandbars. And I did know of one sandbar in a lake that I had fished previously called Shenango Reservoir. It's up around Sharon, Pennsylvania. And I knew of that bar and I thought, well, I'll go. And I took my depth sonder and I found out that it actually was breaking off at a depth of around 15 feet. And I knew that the 100 spoon plug went to 15 feet. So I said, well, I don't, I didn't know anything about pattern trolling. I didn't know about following a break line or anything like that. I just knew I needed that lure to hit that bar at 15 feet. So I threw a marker and then I just started trolling back and forth across the tip of that bar. And it didn't take very long. I bet you it wasn't but it's four or five, six passes across the tip of that bar. I'd be out here free running and come up, bump over the bar and then down the other side. And that lure come up, bumping up about that six times, the lure come bumping up over that bar, and bam, I hit a fish. And I'm not kidding you, it was a four and a half pound large mouth bass. In Pennsylvania, in the middle of summer, that was unheard of. Wow, this is 1970 now. So I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anything about casting or, or anchoring down and casting the point of the bar. I just turned around, trolled back the other way. And I think I caught five or six right in a row on six passes, and then it was over. But I had limited out on big fish. They were all the same size, four and a half, five pound fish, big fish. And I obviously was thrilled. So the next thing I did, I sent Buck a picture. I said, thanks so much. It works up here too, you know, like he didn't know that already, right? <laughs> but at any rate, I continued to go back to that spot. Not knowing what I was doing, I just would troll back and forth across that bar. Keep it up. Some days I went there, nothing happened for two hours. I kept it up. Sure enough, sooner or later, they were there. In a couple of days, I, hit, I would hit like 14 or 15, 16 big fish. Unbelievable. And I didn't know a thing. All I was doing was trolling with one of these rods and a 100 spoon plug. That's all I did. I had no idea what the bar really looked like. All I knew is where it came to a point, And that's what I was hitting. But if I couldn't have trolled, I'd have never met Buck again. I'd have never been in the business. I'd have never had a career. There's a whole lot of things that would have never happened had I not started trolling. Now, every time I caught a limited fish, I would send Buck a picture and tell him how great everything was working, you know. And he started getting the idea that I must be really good. So he invited me to go on another trip. I think I've shared this before with you, in case you haven't heard it. He started to ask me a couple questions in front of a couple of writers that we were with. And he finally realized I didn't know the answers. I really didn't know much of anything. All I was doing was trolling one lure across the end of that bar back and forth over and over and over and over and catching fish. And at the end of that trip, he said, well, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, I believe, I believe when I started getting your pictures. There wasn't any doubt you were catching more fish, more big fish than all the writers at Fish and Facts magazine put together. And then I get you down here and find out you don't know a thing. You don't know nothing. <laughs> he said, it's almost comical. I can't imagine you catching all those fish. You don't know anything. You don't know a first thing about anything. Did you read my book? I said, yeah, I'm reading it. He said, well, okay <laughs> keep reading i said all right and then we left but for some reason during that trip i don't know whether it was just out of pity or whether he took a liking to me i don't know what it was but he invited me on another trip and then another trip and then another trip and as good fortune would have it i started learning and started getting better and eventually had a 40-year career in the fishing business and was on national television, <laughs> taught over 500,000 students, was on TV with Kurt Gotti, a guy that my dad and I used to sit and watch on uh, the American Sportsman 
for an hour and a half every Sunday afternoon. And unfortunately, my dad passed away before he saw me on TV with Kirk Gotti. I'm sure he would have had a grin on his face so wide. I mean, he thought Kirk Gotti was just the greatest. And here's his son on TV with Kirk Gotti. And you know the reason for it? I went trolling. Period. That's it. There's no other way to say it. Trolling made my career in fishing. And trolling gave me the ability to catch stringers like I shared with you earlier. And I could show you hundreds of stringers just like it. And so many of them were caught trolling. Some of them were caught casting, but only because I found the fish by trolling. If you said to me, you can only do one thing, cast and troll, which would you choose? There's no doubt in my mind. It would be trolling every time. However, in real successful fishing, we need to do both. And after we do our Q&A and, and uh, have that fun time together next time we meet, as we begin next month, we're going to be talking about casting. We're going to talk about all kind of details involved and mainly talking about when, where, why, and how to fish deep structure on the cast. And when you get that done and you put it together with proper trolling techniques, you won't catch more fish than anybody else on your lake every time you go. And I don't care the species of fish, the lake type, the time of the year, it doesn't matter. You're going to be the king in your area. That's all there is to it, or the queen. You're going to catch more fish than anybody. And most importantly, once you get to that point, you can take those children's fishing. You can take those sons and daughters and, and nieces and nephews and grandchildren. You can take them fishing, catch them fish, get them involved, get them interested, put a smile on their face and introduce them to what's still today the number one participation sport in this country. And with our help, if we each do the job, we'll bring that new generation of fishermen along and then they can teach theirs. So. Thanks for being with me today, guys. I know sometimes it sounds like I'm on a soapbox, and, and I pretty much am. I want to see you get the truth. And all of those pictures that we showed you today, and the, the ones that I said that I could show you that I'm not showing you, I don't want you to ever think even for one second that I'm bragging about how good I can go catch fish. That's not what I'm doing at all. I'm trying to impress upon you that if you start trolling, if you get your kids started trolling, you're going to produce, end up producing stringers just like that. Because there's nothing all that special about me. I just was smart enough to do what Buck told me to do. He said, no one's teaching trolling, but we are. And it's so important, I can't even describe to you all of the different ways that it's important. Just trust me when I tell you. Become a good troller, and you'll become a successful fisherman. And he was so right. He was so right. He's the greatest. Okay, in closing, I meant to mention it when I told you about getting this, receiving this gift in the mail from Scott Jenkins. I want to tell you a little something about him real quick. He wouldn't want me to. I'm going to anyhow. His mother, Joanne Jenkins, she was Buck Perry's girl Friday. She was his right-hand gal. She was everything in the world to Buck's Bates back in the day. When I started with him and through uh, the 90s, she was the gal. I swear, Buck could have never operated that factory without her. She was just so good. She knew everything. She knew where everything was. She knew where every phone call was. She knew where every appointment was supposed to be. She had her finger on everything. She knew everything. And Buck knew he could rely on her. Because when it came to fishing, let's face it, he was the genius. And his mind was always just going crazy all over the place all the time, but always having to do with fishing. But when it came to the factory, he needed somebody to take care of stuff. And she was the gal. And she was so friendly and so much fun. I mean, I, I loved her just like Buck did. We all loved her. And I'll tell you one quick story while I'm talking about Joanne. One day, Buck and I were in the back. We were running some... Running some uh, paperwork uh, for a show that was coming up on his printer. We were back in the printing room and Joanne came running back from the main office and said, Buck, Buck. She said, I don't know if it's somebody playing a joke or whether it's true or not, but 
on the phone in the office, they said it's the White House. The White House is calling Buck Perry. She said, I thought I'd tell you, I'm not sure if it's real or not. So Buck says, the White House? You kidding? We turn around and we, and of course I'm falling right behind, <laughs> you know. This was gonna be big news if it really was the White House. So we get back into Joanne's office. He picks up the phone, said hello, this Mr. Perry. Now I hear him saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. I see, mm-hmm, okay, uh-huh. Uh, no, I wouldn't be interested in that at all. No, 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 I have no interest whatsoever. But thanks anyhow. And he hung up. I said, Buck, what was that all about? He said, well, it was the White House. I said, it was the White House? What are they calling you for? <laughs> he said, the president wants to go fishing with me. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And my heart just, I'm racing, you know, cause we're always fighting for some publicity and to make people aware of what we have so we can share it, you know, with more people. So my heart's just going crazy. And I said, he wants you to take the president fishing? Huh? He said, I told him, no, I wouldn't be interested in that. I said, what? Are you serious? The president of the United States wants to go fishing with you and you said, no, thanks. Buck, what are you thinking? Do you know how much I could do, do for our business and for, you know, everything we're trying to accomplish? I said, I can't believe you said no. And by the way, folks, at that time, uh, it was President Carter from Georgia. And when, when I said all that to Buck, he looked at me and said, take him fishing. I won't tell you exactly. I'd have to bleep it out. He said, heck, I didn't even vote for him. And he got up and we walked back in and started printing more material. Buck turned down the White House. He turned down taking a president of the United States fishing. I said, you know, in today's world, we would have had 10 million views of that by midnight, you know. Oh my goodness. So I never forget, but Joanne, she was with me. She just shook her head like, what are we gonna do? Buck is Buck. At any rate, Joanne was such an integral part of the company back in the day, and she was rewarded when Buck passed away, we found out that he had left the factory to Joanne. And there were quite a few people that were shocked by that, mainly Joanne, but she was thrilled because she had a love for the factory. She, she had an investment. She invested a lifetime, her lifetime, uh, working with Buck and everything that he stood for and everything that he tried to accomplish, she was behind a lot of that. So she was thrilled by it and, and at the time, uh, that I was working with Joanne over those years. Uh, she had a child uh, named Scott. And Scott now has grown up, but he's been around that business since he was a young child. And he's grown up and he now has taken over and he now owns Bucks Bates. It's important for me to mention that Scott's part of the family. He's part of Bucks Bates family, the company. He's part of the information. He's part of everything. And he's been part of it since his mother was there back in 1970 when I was there. So uh, he shared with me that over the years since I've been gone, that things have been a little bit slow. And I said, well, it's because no one's teaching. Nobody's teaching the truth. But I'm going to come and try to teach the truth. And I said, I want to see not only the new generation of fishermen succeed, but I want to see Bucks Bates. I want to see you and your young family succeed. And because if you don't, and Bucks Bates no longer exists, and no one's making spoon plugs, there's going to be not much hope for the future of our sport. That's how serious it is to me. So I want to encourage you. You know, on my web page, I have a, a link. Down, if you go, scroll all the way down, you come to my tackle box, and it link, there's a link there. It links you to Bucks Bates. So if you have an intention of getting some trolling equipment, lines, reels, rods, getting some spoon plugs, go through Scott, give him a call. In fact, I, uh, I asked him today if there's any way 
uh, that he can cut a little more money off, take a little less money, just to help get some more of these out there in the marketplace so we can get people catching fish. And I'm encouraging you, give Bucks Baits a call, talk to Scott and tell him that you care about him, you care about his future, you care about the future of, of uh, Bucks Baits, uh, as I do. Uh, it's important. Uh, so with all that being said, like us on Facebook, please. And I don't, I hate to keep harping on it, but please subscribe to our channel if you haven't. We've gotten quite a few subscribers lately, so I want you to keep that up. Keep subscribing and uh, keep this story out there. Keep me vlogging and sharing with you because it's what's in my heart. It's what I want to do. But let me know that you're watching and you care about it, and I appreciate you. And we'll see you the next time.